our second Christmas service. I was shocked when I was thinking about that the other day. I'm like, wow, this is our second one. So what I did is I went and I stole my slides from the first one. I read the them okay, but they were good. <clears throat> the only announcements this week is next week being New Year's Eve, just normal service. Uh, we're not going to do anything different. So we'll be back in Acts, as what I have planned for right now, uh, unless the Lord tells me different this week. But uh, I'm excited to get back to Acts. It's been like two weeks not in Acts, and like I'm ready to get back to it. Uh, I feel like I've been learning so much through it, and I hope you have been too. So let's open in prayer, and then we will get into this Christmas message. Father, I thank you again for this time, for this family, Lord. We're, we're yours. We're your kids. We're gathered before you today. Um, may we see you clearly. Lord, may we see your promised Messiah, your son, come, Lord. Uh, not just a, a holiday celebration, but the celebration of a person, Lord. So may we celebrate him. May he be our focus today. We love you, Jesus. We ask that you would be here today, that you would move by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> How many churches are packed today? This is the time of year, right? Everybody goes. This and Easter, everybody floods to the churches. They want to get there. And, and for pastors, I feel like it's a challenge, right? Because you've got to give them something, right? You put that pressure on yourself. You're like, I really got to give them because I'm going to get people I only get to preach to twice a year that are coming today. So I really got to give them something. Well, I said, you know what? Forget that. I'm not going to try the pressure on myself. <clears throat> but as I went through this year, I don't know, every year's different. Listening to the old Christmas carols, they really hit me this year more than I can ever remember. And I was just moved by them. And as I listened to them over and over again, I, I kind of took context. What are they talking about? And I'm talking about the Christmas carols, not the all I want for Christmas you crowd. Because if I hear that song one more time, but the Christmas carols, they speak of the king, the newborn king coming. They speak of angels and shepherds. They speak of a star in the sky. They speak of the glory of God or giving God the glory. They use the term t holy. They use the title Lord. And that's who we're talking about today. It's so easy, and I, I know everybody's going to be preaching it today, to get caught up in the holiday. Right. And that's what they say. Happy holidays. They don't want to say Merry Christmas anymore. And that's fine. Some people get bothered by that. I don't care because Christmas is mine because that's my Christ. He's my king. He might not be yours. You can say happy holidays all you want. But this is my holiday because I'm celebrating my Messiah, my savior of the world who came. So you can say happy holidays. It doesn't bother me. You can go through that. He's my Jesus. And I titled my message today, Born to Die, Born to Rule, because he was both. And often we get caught up in one or the other, but that he was both. And I think to truly understand it, to truly grasp it, it kind of takes the Jewish mindset, right? Go back to the Old Testament. Really dig in and see who were they waiting for to come. The early church, you've probably heard different things about Christmas tree, right? That they're pagan, that they're from Yule. That's actually not the oldest recorded medieval history we have. They actually used the pine trees in Christmas skits, plays, whatever they call them. And they would take, because it was the only tree that was green that time of year, they would bring them into the church and they would put on a play. And they would hang the red bulbs on the tree to represent the apple because they would go all the way back to Adam and Eve because that's the first mention of the Messiah coming in our scriptures. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15 and it said, I will put en enmity, I struggle with that word, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. All the way back in the Old Testament, right after the fall of man, God lets us know someone is coming to save you. He's coming to set things right again. He's going to crush that evil serpent, but it's going to cost him something because he's going to bruise his heel. Revelation gives us a clearer picture of this because this story actually goes farther back than that. <clears throat> All who dwell on the earth will worship him, those whose names have not been written in the book of life. And this is the important part. The lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Before time began, we can't comprehend this. The plan was always for the one to come to save us from our sin. Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. He was born to die and born to rule. 
What's interesting, there's more written, written about the death of the Messiah than the birth. If you think about it, there's only two of the Gospels that really capture the Christmas story. Way for me to throw a wet blanket on Christmas, right? <clears throat> only two times do we really get the details of what happened in Matthew and Luke. John just says, in the beginning was the word. Like that. He goes back before it all began. Mark, who's going to bring Jesus forward as the suffering servant, starts with John the Baptist and gets right into it because a servant has no past. It wasn't important the past of a suffering servant. But the other two Gospels, Matthew bringing Jesus as King Messiah, and, and, and Luke, who's just giving an account of history, the man, bring those two and, and show the birth. But again, there's more in the Bible about his death. And it goes back to Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 5, and 9, 7, and 8 here. And we know these. We've read them not that long ago as we went through the crucifixion, but it's, it's important to remember. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. It's interesting because the Jews missed this part, right? They were looking for the king to come, but they didn't see the, the one who was coming to die. Some of them even believed it was two separate entities that as they studied and went through. In Luke, when Jesus was born, we get a little bit of a picture of this. And she brought forth her firstborn son, of course, speaking of Mary, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. That very famous verse, that term swaddling cloth literally means ripped cloths. And what they were used for in this time usually was the birth of the newborn lambs that were coming out. And they would take them and just wrap them in this cloth. It was also, and it's the same term of what he was wrapped for at his death. So even in his birth, he was being prepared for his death. Because he was born to die. He would go through his, his ministry teaching and preaching this, though the disciples really got it. In Mark 8, 31, he said, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He wanted to make it clear that he came not to rule, not at this point, but he came to die. He came to die for us. He came to die because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And as we look at that manger scene, it is always overshadowed by the cross. It can never be separated. Again, only two times in the Gospels that manger is talked about. But four times we have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's pronounced throughout the rest of the Gospel. So if we sit here and look at baby Jesus, and I love it, it's good. It's it's accumulation of thousands of years of, of a prophecy coming to life, but it has to be overshadowed by the cross. We have to see the cross in Jesus' birth. <clears throat> it's interesting. I was listening to something last night, and he was talking about, we, we get bent on what's said about Jesus, but what did Jesus say? And I'm totally off notes. Um, but when he first came, the very first words we hear from him was when he was 12. Remember when he went to the temple? Imagine, I always think of Mary and Joseph, right? We just lost the Messiah. We have not found him. He's gone. Where is he? And they're searching probably the caravans. And it says three days later. Now, I remember being a little kid and not finding my mom and dad. And I also remember not being able to find my kids. Can you imagine three days? And this isn't any kid. This is Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is the one that the angel appeared in her room and said he's coming. And she lost him. And I'm sure her and Joseph, I'm sure they didn't argue about this. I'm sure, you know, just Holy Mary and Joseph. No, I'm sure they were at each other. Where is he? They go back to the temple and there he is. <clears throat> and he's standing there. And what does he say? Why were you looking for me? That's the first words we get out of Jesus's mouth. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? He was at a business meeting and they didn't even know it. He was doing his father's business. That was his purpose, and his father's business was coming to die on that cross, coming to pay for the sins of the world. The other time when we see him in ministry and in Mark, if you remember this scene, 
where he's preaching and it's so packed they can't get to him. And they rip off the roof and they lower the man down, right? Great scene, great, great application there for friends to bring him to Jesus. And they lower him down and then what he says to him is not what they wanted to hear first. Your sins are forgiven. That's the first thing he says. That was his goal when he came to earth this time. His goal was to die for the sins of the world. His goal was to pay for that sin. And we cannot miss that. And I believe it's missed in Christmas. And the Lord just hammered that home to me. He was born to die. He was born for me. Born to die for me. To die for the sins that I've committed. But again, that's not the only reason he was born. He was born to rule. He was born to be a king. I like that. And all great kings have heralds, right? And I can't help it in my own mind, and please forgive me. I can only think of Aladdin when Genie walks in before him, and he does the whole song, Prince Ali. You know, and he's singing the song, and he's heralding Aladdin coming, and he's making a big deal. It's a parade. And they did that in the old times. They had these huge parades when royalty would come in, and they would celebrate, and they would throw things, and they would have this great herald come in. Well, there was a herald coming before Jesus that was prophesied too. That's how important Jesus is. <clears throat> and in Malachi 4, 5 through, I have 4, 5 here. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Least I come and strike the earth with a curse. That's how it ends. That's how the Old Testament ends. He's coming. A herald is coming. Someone to proclaim the way. I like the story of John the Baptist, and I think it's, again, it's a Christmas story. And when you talk about Zacharias and Elizabeth, here's old Zacharias and Elizabeth, and the Bible says they're old, so I can say that they were old. It says they were well advanced in years. It also says they were righteous before God, walking in the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord. They were blameless, not sinless, but blameless. They followed God, and throughout their life, what did every woman, Jewish woman want? To have a son, and she never had it. The law gave Zacharias permission that day, though it wasn't that was frowned upon by God, we know, to divorce her, but he didn't. And here's this older priest, and he had served the Lord, and there this is the idea to go in and, and to do the incense. It was a great honor to go into the temple and do the incense, and you only ever got to do it once. Once you were selected, you never got to do it again. It was a tremendous honor. And they would cast three different lots, four different lots that day. They would cast two for the, the sacrifice and for the altar. One would go in and they would cast lots just to prepare the incense. And then the final lot was for the one to prepare the incense. So here's Zechariah. The lot, the lot falls on him and he walks up into the temple. He would have two of them on the other side that would help prepare. They would do everything. And as they walked back out, he would be there alone in the holy place. I remember right next to him is the holy of holies. He'll have the, the, the altar of incense, the bread, and the and, and, uh, the lamp next to him, and he would be standing there. <clears throat> and he's going to pray for the nation. That was the goal of this. The incense represents prayer. So he sat there and he would pray. Now imagine this privilege. It is a tremendous privilege for what he's doing. Some priests went their whole life and never got this privilege. He got this privilege. And what God's timing. So he would stand there, and I'm sure he would pray. And what did he pray about? I'm sure he prayed for the nation, and maybe he thought it too much of a, of a bold thing or, or a selfish thing for him to pray, but then the angel appears to him. <clears throat> and it says, Not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayers are heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call his name John. And in Luke 1.17, later on, it said, He will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people, prepare for the Lord. What an honor and a privilege Zechariah had. And he had been faithful his whole life, and I'm sure there was many times as he went before the Lord and, and as a priest, like, why? Lord, why are you not giving me a child? Why are we not getting a son? And as I've had to say between my wife and I the past few months, it's all in the Lord's timing, right? We had to remind each other of that over and over again. It's his timing. It's his way. And Zacharias will get a, a privilege that no other man would really have besides maybe Mary would be the next closest and Joseph. He's going to get a prophesied prophet, the greatest prophet who had ever walked the earth to come. That's really the beginning of the Christmas story. Of course, if... You, 
I'm sure you guys know, as he went through and, and he comes back out, he, well, he questions Gabriel. He says, is this really going to happen? How would I know? He goes, well, this is how you're going to know. You're not going to be able to speak till the baby's born. So imagine that nine months of silence, nine months, he's not able to speak. Well, the child comes and they question, well, what are we going to name him? Usually it's tradition to be named after your grandfather or your father. And Elizabeth says his name will be John. And they're all looking at him, and he writes, his name will be John. And then his mouth is opened. I love that story. His mouth is opened when he finally recognizes and is ready to acknowledge before everybody. And I ask the Lord to do that to me. Keep my mouth shut till I'm ready to acknowledge you as Lord and King and what you've done. And one of the things he says is, is at the bottom of Luke 176 through 79, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That's what he said about his son that is to come. What a beautiful picture. So God has sent his herald. He had prepared two older ones who were going to raise him. If you realize, John the Baptist should have been a priest. Instead of going out into the desert and being a prophet, he should have been a priest. But the herald has come. He has been prepared. And now it's time for the king to come. Imagine being the Jews waiting for this. Imagine hearing this story of Zacharias. They heard this. This wasn't time. He he couldn't talk for nine months. And he was a priest, so basically a pastor. Imagine telling a pastor he can't talk for nine months. They'll go crazy. For nine months, this guy couldn't speak. It was sure it spread. Something happened in there. As he would have come back out and stood in front of everybody, they, well, they would ask, how did it go? He couldn't speak. Nine months. So his son was born. So again, the anticipation is building. What's going on? God is doing something again. He had been silent for 400 years. These are a people who have been overthrown and ruled by Babylonians, Persians, Romans, and many others. They had been slaves in Egypt. They had fought their way through the promised land, and right now they had Rome over top of them. And I'm sure Genesis 49.10 had been in their head. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And again in Numbers, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star, isn't that interesting, will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. A ruler will come out of Jacob. They knew this ruler, this king, he was coming. He was prophesied about in Isaiah 42, 1 and 4. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. They're looking toward this king. And isn't the world looking for something now? They're looking for someone to come and bring peace, to bring justice, because we see how corrupt everything is getting. You can see the Antichrist stepping on the scene and being like, oh, I got you. And and the world's just going to flock to him. But the true king of peace has already come, and he's coming again. We'll get to that. And imagine this in Micah, as as being a Jew, being ruled over by all these people, and you're thinking of this king that will come. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. That's what they're waiting for. Imagine somebody stepping on the scene and saying, let's dismantle all our military in the entire world and turn it into farming equipment. Last year, just for instance, we spent as a nation, or I'm sorry, this year, $8 billion, 16.7 dollars on our defense. The world spent last year $2.24 trillion. Imagine if we turn that into agriculture. Imagine if we use that to feed people. That's what's being said to them. Imagine that promise to come. No more war. All that all Israel has known is war. All they're looking for is peace and he's coming. 
But where? Where was this king going to come? Where was this promised Messiah? And again, the famous Christmas verses, Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from old and from ancient times. And again, Isaiah 7, 14, here's the sign. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel. That reflects all the way back to, again, to Genesis. And they're saying he's coming. This king is coming. The king is coming. They're waiting. There's anticipation. So if you would with me, I don't, I didn't, oh, I did put it on my slides. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 are very famous Christmas verses. Here is Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Mighty Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The king was coming. He was on his way. And he has arrived as we get to Luke 2, 1 through 7. Again, our famous passages. We're going to read all the way down to 20 if you want to turn there in your Bibles. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee and out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his enthroned wife, who is with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. And she brought first her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which to be all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was that when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see the things has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known this saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which they were told by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that he had heard and seen as it was told to them. That is the Christmas story. The king had come. And what I found interesting, I was talking with my kids this week, we, we take this born in a manger and we've romanticized it. But really, I mean, if you think about what this is, it's like if, if he would have been born today, you would have been put in your dog food dish. That was how low it was. He, he would have been put in a barn in where, where the, the animals just are. This is the king. And what always amazes me the way that Jesus came, he was king of kings, lord of lord, the most spectacular human being ever born on this earth. He was divinity in the flesh. He was our savior. And he came humbly, absolutely humbly. And I often wonder, as I think of this heavenly scene, what was going on, I'm imagining the angels going to God the Father. We need to go. We need to proclaim this. And him saying, eh, go to the shepherds, I guess. The shepherds? We should be going to the kings. We should be going to the nations. We should be going to everybody. No, go to the shepherds. And humbly, they go to the shepherds and they proclaim this. And these shepherds, again, these are animal caretakers, and they were low in that day. In that day, to, if you were a shepherd and you witnessed a crime, it would take two or three. They barely counted you as human. And this is who he goes and proclaims himself to. The shepherds come and they worship this newborn king, but they didn't keep quiet about it, did they? They went and they spread it. And so the king had come. 
The king had been born to die, and he had been born to rule. We didn't see Jesus' rule in his first round. But we will see it again, and he made it very clear. In fact, there's more talk about his second coming and his ruling than there is about his birth. In Acts 1.10 through 11, we were just there not long ago, and it said, Ooh. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and he said, Men of Galilee, Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up before you into heaven will come, so come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And again, Revelation 12 says, He who testifies these things, surely I am coming quickly. Amen, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Our king is coming back to rule. And just as clear as it was, he was coming to be born as a baby, born in Bethlehem, born in a manger. He is coming back again to rule, and we can count on it because we've seen it all happen the first time exactly the way Scripture laid it out. And I believe he's coming very soon. And he's coming to rule and reign, and it says there'll be no end to that. Thank goodness. No more elections, no more ballots, no more vetoes. Our king rules with a rod of iron, and he is just and good. And he is coming again. That, to me, is the Christmas message. And I will finish with this. As I listened to the different Christmas carols, one that really stuck out to me this year was Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So I dug up a little bit on it because I like to know the history of the writers. The guy's name that wrote it was Charles Wesley. He wrote it in the early or late 1800s, somewhere in there. And he was only saved for about a year when he sat down and wrote this hymn. I think it's a hymn because if you read the lyrics, man, is it deep. And I'm going to read through some of the lyrics. It says, Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild. And I love this part, God and sinners reconciled. He understood that the coming of Jesus was about God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all He brings. Risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Isn't that beautiful? He got that. And the first, some, some believe it was only three or four months as he was saved, he bought that, sat down and penned this. And we're going to sing it right after this. But that's the story of Christmas. God and sinners reconciled. That Jesus Christ came as a baby humbly to die for us, to die for the sins of the world. So we could be reconciled to God. So we can be called children of God. And with that, if you will take your communion cup. And let's take the bread in our hands. And Father, we thank you for this, for this reminder, Lord, for the sending of your son, Lord, as, as a baby, as a child, Lord, the fulfilling of prophecy, knowing we can trust in you. But we thank you, Lord, he came to die, that he would die for me. And Lord, that his body would be broken for me. Lord, I thank you that you reconcile sinners, Lord. And I thank you for, again, for this remembrance of you. Let's take the bread. You can open your cup if you can get it open. Oh my goodness. And Father, we thank you for this cup, Lord, that you took this cup, cup of wrath, Lord, so we can take this cup, Lord, a cup of communion with you. Lord, that you've restored us, that you brought us back to you, Lord, and it was because of your blood. Lord, let us not take that for granted in this season, Lord. May we not celebrate a holiday, but celebrate your son. So we thank you again for the blood that was spilt for us. We take this in remembrance of you. Amen. Go ahead and take the cup. Now, 
That went really, really fast. So we're going to sing. I have three more songs to sing. And again, I, I love Hark the Herald. I don't know. It just stuck with me this year. It was on repeat in my car and just the uh, theology of it. Um, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but it's in my head. It's really difficult to find hard songs to sing. So forgive me when I find these songs, especially the Christmas songs. I must have listened to like an hour and a half of Christmas, like Hark the Heralds, just Hark the Heralds till I found one I felt like we could sing with. So if it's not that great, it's the best I could find. So anyways, with that, we will, we will sing. <laughs>